recording hello folks welcome back to the podcast i'm doing back-to-back nights of this i uh, talked to steve kelly last night and due to some scheduling stuff i have to do one tonight as well so i'm going to welcome joe smith to the podcast how you doing tonight joe good thanks for having me down he's good he's down in iowa city i'm um, doing some of his workouts for the hawkeye football program so i'm excited to talk to a D1 athlete uh, currently in one of the programs right now. So this is episode 44 uh, of the Brit West Hancock Kanawha Athletics Podcast. Like always, though, I have sponsors for the show um, to raise money for the Sanger Legacy Fund. I have 18 of them tonight that wanted to jump on and sponsor the Joe Smith episode. So uh, my sponsors, without further ado, I have the Brit Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Cruise, Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company, Daniel's Auto Collision, Nick Schmidt, Sidetrack Lanes, Wilson's Diner, Britt Food Center, Levi Don Trucking, Miller and Sons Golf Cars, Britt Vet Clinic, The World with Nate Podcast, The Original Saw, Mary Jo's Hobo House, The West Hancock Hall of Fame, Bill Frito, Katie's Salon and Tanning, The Britt Bar and Grill, Coogee Professional Power Washing, and then I have an anonymous donor. Uh, sports update, pretty much same as last night, talking baseball, softball. Tonight, the team plays at South Hamilton. Uh, that's baseball, July 2nd. They play West Fork and Districts. Softball, same stuff as I said last night, if you watch that. Tonight, they're at South Hamilton. The 29th, they're at Belmont. And then July 1st is regionals against St. Ansgar. Uh, it's a reminder that the Sanger Legacy Fund was created to honor the great, late, great coach Bob Sanger and his wife, Linda. Uh, please consider giving to the Legacy Fund at sangerstrong.com or contact me if you need more help with that. Uh, you can always re, uh, set up recurring payments, which is a nice thing to do if you want to automate your giving. All right, way back when, 10 episodes ago on episode 34, I talked to Candace Wilson, who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame here soon. 20 episodes ago, episode 24, Brent and John Hagen, four uh, time state finals between the two of them, won six state championships. They're also going into the Hall of Fame. 30 episodes ago on episode 14 was Chad Trollson, and 40 episodes ago on episode four was Bob Steenledge, the first ever four-time state champion. He is getting inducted to the Hall of Fame as well. And speaking of the Hall of Fame, at halftime of the Garner game on August 26th, the first ever members of the West Hancock Hall of Fame will be announced. After the game, there will be a reception at the Brick Country Club to honor the inductees. Please come to the game, to the reception, to honor these great um, coaches, athletes, and teams from Britt Kanawa and Wes Hancock. Thanks to Steve Lansing and the committee and the Sanger Legacy Fund for making this happen. And Joe, you and your teammates will be in there someday for winning that state title back in 2019. I guarantee that. My next sponsor uh, is the World with Nate podcast. Nate Allison is the brother of a friend of ours from our church down here in Indianola. He has his own podcast called The World with Nate. He uh, hits on a lot of great topics and his goal is to help and inspire people. Nate's an Iowan who loves helping people reach their dreams. Please check out his podcast. Again, it's The World with Nate. It's Nate's full-time job. That's his source of income doing his podcast. So if you can give him a follow and watch his podcast and support him, that'd be great. The Brit Bar and Grill is a veteran-owned sports bar in downtown Brit that offers family dining, fun, and live entertainment. From ribeye steaks or burgers to roasted chicken or wings, come enjoy a meal and a local game on the biggest of screens or any of your favorite teams. Restaurant is open from 11 to 1 and 5 to 8 Monday through Saturday, and the bar is open 11 to 6 on Sundays. Mary Jo's Hobo House and Catering in Brit has been a huge West Hancock supporter for almost 30 years. Travel Iowa's voted the Hobo House as one, having one of the best 10 burgers in Iowa. Visit Mary Jo's Hobo House for lunch and breakfast every day at 72 Main Avenue South. Call them at 843-3840, but do it soon because they're um, retiring here in the next month or so. Congrats to Linda and Mary Jo on their upcoming retirement. And thank you to the Brick Car Truck Bike and Tractor Night Cruise for sponsoring over 30 episodes. Jared Winger and his company run these great events, and they're coming up soon, July 20th, August 17th, and September 21st. They're all on Wednesday night, so it's easy to get out to. He also owns Mojo Productions and Brit. The fifth annual event has free kids activities, Trophies are presented for all categories and a $1,000 award is given out at each show. You can't beat free admission and great food and drink from Brit vendors only. Check out the video on his website, BritCarCruise.com. All right, Joe, here we go. We're going to talk some, uh, some West Hancock football and some Iowa Hawkeye football. And my, one of my seven-year-old boys is pretty excited that I'm doing the podcast with an Iowa Hawkeye. 
that's his team and he loves them and he asked if you have any sports cards so uh said someday he will (laughs) someday just be patient so yeah thanks again i like i said i'm excited to be on here with uh with a current division one athlete i'm a hawkeye fan obviously i'm a west hancock fan so this will be a lot of fun um to get on here with you and talk about some football and whatever else pops up so uh let's jump right in with west hancock football uh well first of all let's talk about um how's your family doing how's life down in iowa city i mean i'm doing fine um workouts are going good i mean i'm improving every week and weather was a little hot last week so that made it a little a little bit of a grinder last week but mm-hmm. i'm doing good family's doing good and thankful for where i'm at so yeah yeah yep your brothers are gonna be juniors mm-hmm. yeah and they uh they did okay last season so I'm, we're hoping for a another good one uh did yeah, you get a chance okay. to get back to any of their games last year or is it pretty um, tough with what you do uh, i think on one of the bye weeks i went home for the hartley melvin sanborn playoff game so that was yeah. fun to watch so yeah that was a good i only game. got back with that one though yeah i can't imagine i mean it's what you guys do your schedule's pretty tight and hard to get away so mm-hmm. yeah we're hopeful 2022 is just as good as 2021 back in brit so we'll see what happens but speaking of west hancock football let's get into your career um and you're going to at some point think that you're getting older because um, 2016 probably seems like a long time ago. But I'll tell you right now, it uh, it just goes faster as the years go by. 2004 was my senior season. I'm like, holy cow, that's, we're pushing 20 years on that now. What happened? Mm-hmm. But 2016 through 2019 was your uh, four-year career at West Hancock. Um, let's start with the first three years, 2016, 2017, 2018. What are some of the memories you have uh, from middle school football up through your junior year of football going into that state championship season? Um, I mean, first off, I'd say like it's mostly just me looking at these scores and kind of remembering stuff. But yeah. I would say a big thing, um, my sophomore year started out 0-2. Mm-hmm. Probably not how uh, West Hancock does it, but. That was a that was a bit of a rough rough patch, but I remember I think the most I remember from my sophomore season is just us getting some momentum going, and then having a good playoff run, and then playing West Sioux, and they were really good. Um, yeah, Deckers is starting for Iowa State this year, so I mean they they were a good team. Um, you know, so yeah, sophomore year was fun. It was my first time playing varsity. I remember that. I remember uh, freshman year. Uh, the only varsity action I got freshman year was against uh, Rockford, and that was for like. I was for like one drive at the end of the game. And I just yeah. remember being like as nervous as can be for that. But did, did you feel like the speed of the game was just like twice as fast as playing JV? I mean, uh, I don't know if the speed, I mean, obviously it seemed faster to me. I think that was just faster than me because I was just nervous. But yeah. Yeah. I don't know you're, how much faster it was. I don't know how they weren't very good, but yeah. And you're a, you're you're a fast that. guy to begin with. When I played uh, 2002, I got in at homecoming against St. Ed's and on the line so i'm actually not a speed sir by any means and i just remember going holy cow in a jv game i would have gotten to that guy in a varsity game it's like you gotta pick it up so yep. yeah yeah your your first two years um quarterfinals uh freshman year we lost to garrigan 12 to 8 one of those games that we probably should have won probably should have gone yep. to the finals sophomore year you said west sue holy cow uh 54 to 12 that's just one of those teams that it doesn't matter how good you are they're just going to be better um, I think they had at least two, maybe three D1 athletes, five, six guys played college ball, I think, um, including is a hundred deckers. So so, yeah. yeah, he's gonna be the the QB at Iowa State. But um, yeah, the what stood out to me was man, those Garner losses. Um, we were kind of in the middle of a slump against Garner, but what I always say with losing to Garner is well, look how they did compared to look how we did, even though they beat us in week one we made the playoffs, made the quarterfinals, and they were nowhere to be found in the postseason. That's kind of how I always look at that. But on the years where we beat Garner, it's usually the season ends in the dome if, you know, not a championship. So um, that's how I look at it anyway. Yeah. But uh, did that hurt losing to Garner? I mean, obviously it didn't feel good. Like, oh, yeah, we lost to Garner. But, like, did that sting for the rest of the season or did you guys get over that pretty quick? I wouldn't say stung for the rest of the season. I definitely say it was like uh, those Monday practices. We were just hitting the sled and you're kind of before the practice starts, you're talking with the coaches about what you could improve on and stuff like that. I think not that those losses needed to happen, but I mean, 
uh, things happen because of like how prepared you are, I'd say. I'd say mm-hmm. my my uh, sophomore and junior year, showing up to that Garner game, it was wanted to beat them so bad, but didn't actually think about what it took to beat them. And I mean, I think it's pretty um, it's pretty simple how to do it. Uh, I think we accomplished it my senior year, but it was pretty much a lot of times it was just us shooting ourselves in our own foot, stuff like yep. that, where jumping off sides or just not doing your not fulfilling um, your role in the team or your responsibility. I'm saying on like the plays and stuff like that. Yeah. And I have always said too, if we played Garner, like last year, they played HMS in a non-district game in like week six. If we would play them in any other week, but week one, I don't think we'd ever lose to them. I don't know. It seems like that first week, um, just hard to get into the groove with the offense defense always seems to be decent, but just getting into that groove seems to be kind of tough. And Mm -hmm. that's my theory, but obviously there's nothing you can do about it looking at it now. But I think if we played him in a different week of the season to be a different story so mm-hmm. and yeah your junior year it lost them seven nothing in overtime and if I remember right didn't they score that touchdown in overtime I think it was zero zero going into overtime wasn't it yep and then we yeah. threw the ball on our first down and it got picked off <laughs> yeah yeah like coach Sanger always said three things can happen when you throw the ball and two of them are bad mm-hmm. but, yeah but get that point you gotta try to throw them off a little bit and then, then you guys, uh, you ran through, uh, you got past Emmitsburg, Osage, Four City, <clears throat> lost to Garrigan on September 21st of 2018. That was our last district loss as of today, June 28th, 2022. We haven't lost a district game since that game. So 20, the rest of 18, 19, 20, and 21 were, have a pretty good district uh, winning streak going. And then you guys ran the table through the rest of the regular season. Uh, beat Hinton in the first round of the playoffs, beat Akron uh, in the first, second round in the quarterfinals, both on the road, and then Hudson in the Dome. Uh, does that one still sting a little bit? Uh, I mean, a little bit. Yeah. Uh, we fumbled the ball. That was always – I mean, that was always what happened. If we if if we lost a game, like I said, it's only because of us screwing ourselves over. I think we fumbled the ball like five times in that game. And they were all in the first quarter, I think, except for that very last one on that last drive. But yeah, it was um, twenty-eight to zero at one point. Or yeah, been, then, I think it was twenty-eight to zero at one point. Yep. And then you took the opening kickoff in the second half back for a touchdown, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we kind of got into our stride. And I, I still, I don't think that was a fumble at the end. Uh, quarterback sneak by Braden that would have gotten us a first down. We would have scored, gone mm-hmm. for two, and I think we would have won the whole thing. I know that's a coach mark sanger felt like um at that time so yeah um, i think yeah they um they beat a a h s t w by like 30 points it was like 30, 30 to, i think it was 30 to 7 i looked that up 37 yeah. Day. yeah that so, always hurts but mm-hmm. um, another thing that happened obviously uh coach bob sanger is when he got sick and was diagnosed with cancer right in that season uh, what was that like having to respond to that and keep playing through and support the Sangers and um, the whole community getting together for the Sangers? What, what do you remember about that? Well, I remember about that. I just remember um, when he told us, I remember it was like a, like a 6.30, like morning weights thing on like a Tuesday or something. And I mean, it kind of shows the kind of guy he was. It was simply like, hey, like, I'm not going to be here for a week or two. Like I have to go do this. I have to like go do chemo or something. Like I think that really kind of showed his character, how strong of a guy he was, where it was like, he didn't make a very big deal about it. It's how I'm kind of, I'm kind of phrasing it. It was more like, I'll be gone for two weeks, but I'll be back. And you guys just keep doing you. So I think that really shows um, what he was about. Yeah. He never, never wanted to be about him. Mm -hmm. It was always, always about the team and always about you guys. And um, that, that didn't change. I mean, I'm, what are you 21 i'm 35 some a dozen plus years older than you and uh it, it was it was just like that back in the early 2000s where it wasn't about him and his wins and accolades and championships it was it was about us and it, that's you know the signs of a great coach so mm-hmm. um, and, and we're going to get more into your senior year here in a few minutes um and that'll be a, a part of that story is with coach and having to sit out most of your senior season and then he passed away a couple months later and with Mark taking over. But um, you, you can't talk West Hancock football without talking Bob Sanger. Uh, but another guy you can't hardly go without talking about is Gene Perkins. Uh, so he coached you your freshman and sophomore year. And then he hung it up uh, also due to some health issues and stuff. And then Coach Sanger 
was only a part of a little bit of your junior and senior season. Not that he wasn't there, obviously, but it wasn't like it had been for the last, you know, 50 years. So talk about Coach Perkins a little bit. I didn't put this on the notes. I'm putting you on the spot here, but. Um, Coach Perkins, um, fun guy. That's, I mean, that would be the main thing I say. He's a jokester, that's for sure. But yep. really good defensive coordinator. Um, I think a lot of the reason why I like Iowa is it reminds me a lot of uh, Britt coaching style-wise. You know, you talk about Bob Sanger being there for 52 or 53 years. 52, I got yeah. I got Coach Ference here. He's been here a long time. Um, mm-hmm. All the, a lot of I uh, for football for me, I would say I like being around people that have been around the game for a long time. Mm-hmm. I, I like people that aren't about this hype stuff and this and that. So, yeah. with Gene, it was it was a lot of fun having him. Really good defensive coordinator. I think he explains stuff well. I think he uh, I think he brought an edge to practice too. When you mm-hmm. talk about somebody, that's kind of just like uh, I don't know. When I think of him, I think like a. Uh, holding his fist up and stuff like that. But yeah, a guy that definitely, definitely gets after it and wants you to get after it, wants to see you succeed. So, yeah. And you said he's getting after it and he's been doing that for, you know, 50 years. You'd think mm-hmm. after those many years, that many years that you'd kind of mellow out a little bit, but I, he had that same fire after all those years. So that was always something I loved about coach Perkins mm-hmm. as well. We're going to hit a few sponsors here and then we're going to talk about the state championship season of 2019. All right, the Britt Food Center is your locally owned, family operated hometown grocery store in Britt. They offer fresh produce, fresh cut meat, fresh bakery and homemade deli items. They're working hard to meet the needs and requests of their community. The Britt Food Center is a proud supporter of Wes Hancock. They're open seven days a week from eight to eight daily, except on Sunday when they're open eight to six. Check them out at BrittFoodCenter.com or follow them on Facebook for deals and specials. Call them at 843-4429, that's the Britt Food Center. Miller and Son Golf Cars. Miller and Son Golf Cars is your family owned operated uh, golf car place with over 50 years of business experience. Skip and Jim Miller worked together with their dad Monty until his passing in 1996. Associated with EasyGo, Miller and Sons now calls on over a thousand golf cars in three states. Companies and courses are always extremely happy with their products, service, and honesty. This has resulted in double digit growth each passing year. Based in outside of Brit, Miller and Sons employs 18 full-time employees and three part-timers. The next generation is being trained as we speak to ensure long-term stability. For more information, contact them at 843-4132, email them at customer service at millergolfcars.com, or visit them online at millergolfcars.com. That's Miller and Sons Golf Cars. The original saw company is the leader in American-made radial arm saws, cross-cut power saws, and beam saws. They also offer accessories such as extension tables, measuring and clamping systems, dust shrouds, and miter saw stands. Original Saw's product lines include items for both the hobby woodworker and complex automated industrial settings. Sister company, Williams and Hussey Machine and Tool, manufactures and sells molders and accessories for making custom and stock moldings and trim. Original Saw provides through Jones Machinery a preventative maintenance and repair service of wood and metalworking machinery throughout the Midwest. Want to know more about the Original Saw company? Check them out at originalsaw.com. The Jay Hiscock State Farm Team and Brit is a proud supporter of Wes Hancock and the Sanger Legacy Fund. They can help you with all your insurance needs, including auto, home, life, farm, business, and renter's insurance. For a free quota review, give Jay or Lindsay a call at 843-3563. Go Eagles, says Jay. Katie Salon and Tanning is owned by Katie Walk mother of Braden Walk, who has two championships. Uh, They're located on Main Street in Titanka. Uh, She's been there for almost 17 years now. Services offered her men's, women's, and children's haircuts, colors, perms, waxings, styles, and tanning, plus many brands of retail available. Find Katie's Salon and Tanning on Facebook or Instagram or call them at 928-2303 for appointments. And then Nick Schmidt, I want to thank him for sponsoring all these episodes. Nick's a 2000 West Hancock grad and just wanted to give back to the Sanger Legacy Fund, so thanks to Nick. All right, Joe, let's talk some 2019. Um, West Hancock, Britt Football had won two state titles, 1973, 1996, and I'm sure you remember the story of, hey, if we win it this year, that'll be 23 years in between each, you know, you know these, these two titles and then from the second title to the third. Uh, what kind of pressure did you guys feel in 2019 between Coach Sanger's illness and just the fact that you'd kind of been tagged um, for several years as the team that could probably win the next one? I want to really say um, much pressure about the state championship. I was more worried about just beating Garner the first game. 
I mean, you're talking about that. It had been like seven years since we beat them. And I had never beaten them up to that point. So I just really, I mean, I really wanted to beat them that year. That was really my main focus. And then after that, it was, I'm never really a guy that's all about um, looking way off in November and all that. It was just week after week. And it's hard. I mean, with the RSI that we were doing, that's how the uh, playoff brackets are made. It's it, it was hard to make the playoffs. My junior year, we barely made the playoffs. And then yeah. my senior year, I was more worried about if we could win a district. Um, if we could win our district, then we'd be in the playoffs. And yeah. Were the, uh, were the coaches pretty good at keeping it one week at a time? I mean, I, the community members, they can look ahead. They can talk about it. And then, of course, they talk to you guys about it. But did you guys stay pretty grounded then with the coaches? I mean, I would say so. Yeah, it was it was really one week at a time. And there was there's a lot of teams we played that. I mean, every team we played kind of did stuff different and it was just preparing for them and being ready that they might be able to surprise us a little bit with what they did. Yeah. Um, and with Coach Sanger being sidelined and it being eventually, you know, end up being his last season. Um, did you guys have any pressure there or was that always in the back of your head of we need to keep winning for coach? I mean, you could definitely say that. I think uh, um, for homecoming, he kind of came home and all that, and it was really good to see him. And mm-hmm. it was a good, it was good to go out there on homecoming and have a game, knowing that he was watching. I think it was definitely in the back of my head, um, just seeing him, you know, seeing the weight he had lost and stuff like that. It really made me. Um, I, I, I would say it kind of guided the team, really made him more focused, and like, um, you know, let's give him something to be uh, cheerful about in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I you can't not include Mrs. Sanger and then Mark as well. Um, for Mark to have to kind of run the show for his dad and with what his dad was going through, I couldn't imagine how exhausted Mark probably was and tired and stressed to and uh, getting married coming up and all that stuff. I mean, it was had to have been a challenging couple of years for the Sangers. So um, I'm just so glad it it ended the way it did. Um, mm-hmm. and you got to so got to end his career with, and you got to end your career with a with a ring. So, um, yeah, you said you, beating Garner, you guys beat them on the road, forty eight twenty six. And uh, Nick Horseman, I played football with Nick. He lives here in Indianola. His wife Brittany um, is a Garner grad, and her dad was the high school principal. And I just remember uh, running into Brittany at church the Sunday after that game, and she was like. My dad said that team put the whooping on us, and that's one of the best West Hancock teams he's ever seen, and that they're going to be good. I was like, yep, I could have told you that, but it was nice just to hear that from someone from the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, And then your regular season was just kind of weird because you guys had four non-district games to start the season. Garner, then you beat Emmitsburg on the road 41-13, which if you're any bit of a West Hancock football buff – getting a win against Emmitsburg doesn't happen very often. They, uh, back in their heyday, uh, got the best of us more times than not. Then we had two straight home games, Osage and Four City, so kind of old North Iowa Conference rivals. You Mm -hmm. probably don't even remember the North Iowa Conference. You've only probably known the TIC, which for us old timers, it kind of bugs me that they call it the TIC and it's all these other teams. But back in the day, it was the the original NIC, Four City, uh, Osage, Garner, Lake Mills, Northwood, Newman got mixed in there, Buffalo Center. Uh, But yeah, 42-7 win against Force City, 54-20 win, uh, or a 56-18 win against Osage, 42-7 win against Force City, put you guys at 4-0 in the non-district, and then you had five district games to uh, qualify for the playoffs. How'd you guys, how are you guys feeling, do you remember, after the, uh, after the non-district slate? Um, I think it was just good getting out of that getting out of the non-district slate like you're saying I mean a lot of those schools are playing were a lot bigger bigger than us I always kind of took pride in that too I mean four cities 2a Garner's 2a Osage is they're either 2a or 1a yeah they bounce yeah they bounce between the two yeah all schools with a lot more kids not a lot more but more kids to pick from than we had and it just feels good to be a be a class a team and to walk into their house or go against them and beat them that bad I'd say yeah I was glad to see four city one to put us back on the schedule. Um, yeah. When I, I played them in 2001, 2002 and 2003. And after the 2003 game, their athletic director came over to ours, uh, Mr. Timmerman and said, we're never playing you guys again. And he's like, what? And he goes, well, we're three a, if we beat you, we should. And if we lose to you, it's terrible. And so I was like, I don't know if we'll ever play him again, but they, 
they got back to it and now they're probably mm-hmm. wishing they didn't again but um, they almost got us in 2020 that would have been a uh, quite the shocker the year after you yeah got, that went to thir- overtime or something didn't 13 it? to 7 i believe cole scored a couple touchdowns to win at that game so uh let's move on to districts here you guys start with garrigan which you know that's tough because garrigan's always been the the other team to beat and they have gotten our number a couple times as well but didn't have a whole lot of problems with Garrigan on the road, 54 to 20. And then didn't get challenged a whole lot the next few weeks. North Union, you guys beat on the road, 62 to 8. Uh, West Fork, you beat. That was homecoming, Coach Sanger's mm-hmm. birthday. And they had the 1973 championship reunion team um, at Jim Deemer's house that night. We beat West Fork 62 to nothing. And then uh, GTRA on the road, 47 to nothing. And then uh, I was talking to Mark Sanger uh, the week of the Belmont game. And I said, Mark, I really hope Belmont challenges you guys. And he's like, I do too. Because one thing I, I've coached football and other sports, one thing that's tough about when you're just flat out better than the first six, seven teams you've played and you're not playing great competition some weeks, it's kind of easy to get complacent as a 15, 16, 17 year old kid. Uh, did you guys feel that at all, or were you feeling like you were hitting your stride and getting better every week? I wouldn't say we were getting complacent. I would say I was I was worried about the Beaumont game because um, we had to beat them to win to win the district that we were in. Yep. And like I said, I had never won a district title or anything like that. But uh, Belmont, that was, um, like my junior year, they were they were re- they were pretty good. I mean, we barely beat them my junior year to make the playoffs. So I mean, going into my senior year, they had a lot of guys back and. I think um, they were definitely a pretty good team and we were definitely preparing for that, but yeah, I think we kind of showed out and we put a lot of points up. Yeah. 55 to seven to, yeah, you said you got your district title, which uh, is kind of crazy that you only won one district title in four years. Cause yeah. uh, from the mid eighties till now, it, every class like graduating class has it two or more for the most part. Oh, really? Um, <laughs> uh, some had two, some had three, some had four. Um, but you guys, I'd say at the end of the day, walking off of that state championship, you'd, you'd take that over a couple more district titles. So, uh, it is crazy how that works out, but, and then playoffs, um, I think we were considered the top seed in the playoffs. If they called it that they don't really, but, um, they, the association can be weird. Uh, you'd think their goal would be get the top four teams to the dome, but some years that doesn't work out. They always go by uh geography or whatever but um we got a pretty good draw i'd say they sent us west again even though we got a host um first round was ikm manning we beat them 38 to 14 if i remember right it was pretty close in the first half i want to say we were only up maybe a score at halftime is that what you recall i remember being close the first quarter and then i think um in the last minute we scored twice i think we scored and then we got a fumble or something and we scored again so Took yep. a lot of pressure off, I think, for that game. Yeah, it was kind of a rainy, misty night too, wasn't it? And, mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they, had, were... they had some. Uh, they had this one guy. Was, they had that that running back. Um, he was really fast and stuff like that. And yep. they had a big quarterback. Yeah, and their coach uh, had been the uh, IKM coach for years, and then they combined mm-hmm. with Manning, and uh, I think he's going on like thirty-five years as a head coach, and always did a nice job. Beat us in 06 in the semis in the dome. They won state that year. Um, always a well-coached team so you get out get out of the first round um, feeling pretty good Um, just getting that monkey off your back of you know one down three to go or were you guys thinking just week at a time still I think um, if I'm be honest that first playoff game was a pretty uh, stressful one we had a couple people out and um, so we were missing a couple guys we had a couple a couple of people had to step up and play some positions they hadn't really played in. And this was the biggest game of the season so far mm-hmm. or whatever, but, you know, I was happy. I was happy we got out of there with the win and I was happy that those guys were able to step up. Cause I think they definitely contributed later on for the next couple of games too. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, South O'Brien was your quarterfinal opponent. First time we'd ever played South O'Brien and uh, they probably wish that they hadn't. We beat them 43 to nothing in the quarterfinals to make it to the dome. Uh, you had made it to the dome the year before, a uh, pretty big deal. Did it feel the same this year in 2019, or was it more just, yep, that's the next step, let's keep going? If I'm be honest, it, it did feel a little different. Um, that game was my last time playing on Sanger Field, and that felt like mm-hmm. I was really kind of thinking that too. So 
kind of a little, little heartfelt moment and all that, but it was good yeah. to beat them. I mean, they came in with, uh, if I remember right, they had the top rusher in like the entire state yeah. at running back. And I think we held them to like 15 yards or something rushing. Yeah. So yeah, it was a that, good game. that's been so typical of all those Northwest teams. Uh, my friend is the principal at HMS and we've taken them down what three times in the last two seasons. And he says, I hate it when we, the playoff brackets or pods come out and we see Wes Hancock because our kids are athletic kids they're big kids. All those Northwest teams are huge. They're the big Dutch kids, but mm -hmm. then we just hit them and hit them and hit them again. And they finally just crack and uh, between South O'Brien and Woodbury central and HMS and some of those schools, they, they come to Brit and don't leave very happy because it's just a different type of physical game in, in North Central Iowa, I always say. So long bus yeah. ride home from. Yeah. Yeah. They don't get the trophy they wanted at the end of the season. So moving on to the dome here, uh, you guys matched up with Woodbury Central. Uh, again, if you're a football buff, um, we played them in the 2010, 11, and 12 playoffs and had a couple, you know, one game was a we're down, I think, two touchdowns, came back and won on the road, and then beat them fairly handily the other two games. Uh, but this was kind of their best stretch in school history that decade of uh, their football program. And four times they ran into us. And at the Dome, it was not much different. It was 49 to 20. I remember uh, my sister got married earlier that fall, and so I couldn't use my, I burned up my personal days. So oh, I yeah. couldn't go to the Dome because our superintendent would find out probably. And so we're in professional development meetings and I have my computer open to the game and I'm not paying any attention to what we're doing in our staff meetings. And before I know it, I have like three or four guys like looking around, you know, at my computer checking out the game. But um, this was kind of your standout game, I'd say. You were the guy they picked to be the player of the game and they kept showing you replays. Uh, what do you remember about the Woodbury game to win and make it to the title game? Um, if I'm being honest, uh, for what I felt kind of bad for him because, um, they're running back like towards ACL that week of practice and all that. So they were missing him. He was like their leading rusher and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I think what I remember most is just, um, it felt good to, felt good to finally like get over that hump. That's kind of what it was. I would say like my high school, uh, career was kind of junior year, finally got over that hump and made it to the dome, uh, senior year, finally got past that semifinal game. So I'd say yeah. those are the things I really remember from it. We played good. I don't think we fumbled the ball and um, scored a lot of points. I think uh, I remember, I think Ryland scored a touchdown. He was probably, a, he was a freshman. He was yep, a lot, right lot better at football his freshman year than I probably was. So <clears throat> yep. I'm sure that was really exciting for him. And it was, it was, um, it was good to see other people, other people succeed and other people get in the game, get in such a big game and get a play on the Utah Dome. So I was happy to see that, I'd say. Yeah. And uh, Ryland's brother, Kaysen, made all seven extra points in that game. And if you've been around West Hancock football enough years, you know, we don't make a ton of extra points. It's just kicking's yep. never been a strong suit. And he, he hit them all that game. And that was pretty fun to see. I think it's a school record for most extra points in a playoff game, actually. So. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was fun. And then uh, state title game, Grundy center. We beat them 21 to 17. Uh, we've played them three years in the playoffs now in a row, title game, quarterfinals, title game, and it's turned into quite the rivalry. This was the first one. <clears throat> There's some crazy stuff that went on during the game. Uh, you know, they might say that they had the game won if a call or two or a bounce or two went their way, but um, we dominated the running game with like 388 yards rushing, which is a state record for class A championship game. Most carries in a game is also a record. They couldn't stop us all game. We just couldn't pull away a um, couple times that we probably should have maybe put up a score or two more. Uh, before we get to the actual winning the championship, every single time they showed Coach Sanger on that board up in the press box and the whole crowd, even I think a lot of the Grundy people too, started chanting his name and stuff. Did you guys notice that during the game or was it hard to – uh, I think I knew he that. was up in that box. I think he was up there for the semifinal game. And then, yeah, he was up there for that finals game. And I mean, no, nah, I mean, as you said, you didn't want to talk about the game yet, but I remember uh, when we finally won it, we all turned around and were pointing to him. So that was a, that's like a good memory I got. Yeah. Yeah. That, uh, again, I couldn't be there. Um, I had school that day. Couldn't, I didn't have any personal days. And I told my students the day before because they became Wes Hancock fans, my eighth graders, 
And they, some of my kids would actually watch the games on the live stream instead of go to the I-35 games or they'd watch the replay or whatever the next day. And I told them the day before, if you guys do all your work today for tomorrow, we're just going to watch the game in the afternoon because I'm not missing the game. Yeah. And I think I scared a lot of my students about every play or something going on. I was about losing my mind. I just, I just so wanted you guys to win that game for coach. Um, you know, he just deserved that third championship so much for what he went through. And man, when uh, Tate took that trophy after the team picture and like sprinted over to that end zone where the press box was, oh man, I, getting goosebumps just talking about it right now uh just so cool to see him get that last win that last championship and then your guys a senior year you got to wrap up your careers like that uh what else do you remember from that game or after the game or the days after that I think the biggest thing I remember is that it was uh we had the first semifinal game on a Friday and then that championship game was on a Thursday yeah. and I went to um Iowa versus Minnesota I went to that game day visit um on Saturday and mm -hmm. I just remember we had practice, we had practice on Sunday then. I just okay. remember the, I don't know, I was super into the recovery back then. And I remember the sit only six days till the next game. I was kind of mad about that, but yeah, and I, I shouldn't have, I probably shouldn't have gone to the Iowa game. I should have went home and got a lot of sleep or whatever, but that's probably the biggest thing I remember. Um, second thing, probably just, uh, I kept talking about how, like, um, whenever we don't fumble the ball, we win games. Mm -hmm. I remember fumbling the ball and just the panic in my panic in my heart as that dude started running with it. So that's probably yeah. the other big thing. Cause you get to that state championship and it's like, this is it. There's 48 minutes and a mistake here and a mistake there could cost you. Um, you're playing North union in the regular season and you make a mistake. You're still going to win by 40. Um, but man, that state championship game, it's here it is type of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, you guys, I mean, you're, you're going to go down in history as, you know, legends of the program, you know, for the last 40, 50 years, there's been a lot of success, but um, 32 trips to the playoffs, four championships, there's only four groups of guys that can say that they won a championship, four groups of seniors, and you guys are one of them. So mm -hmm. um, getting those rings and the, the pep rallies and stuff had to have been a pretty, pretty fun experience for you guys at that time. So yeah, anything else on your high school career? Anything else? Um, you know, it was just a, it was just a, it was a good time. It's um, it's a good thing to be a part of a program that's got kind of like a history behind it, and that's mm -hmm. kind of historically good. Um, sometimes I sometimes I feel for some of those schools where it's tough to get people out for football and a lot. So I'm just grateful to that I went to West Hancock and that we had a tradition of running the same offense and everyone everyone got to contribute and practices were fun because people are happy to be there and all that. So. I think that's probably my biggest thing is, you know, it's a, it's a good thing to go to school in Brit and it's a good thing to, good thing to be a part of the football team. That's got such a history. It's a fun thing to yeah. be a part of. Yeah. I, I just love um, watching you guys offensively. Cause yeah, you know what we're going to do. We're going to run the wing tee. We're going to run the ball. I couldn't imagine being a defense against you guys because your offensive line was phenomenal. It had to be one of the best lines we've ever had big, strong, fast, and even if we had average running backs back there, that line was going to, we were going to move the ball, even with, you know, I could have gone back there and run the ball for three, four yards. Sometimes would have pulled a hamstring, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but then you go Tate up the middle, Tate up the middle, Tate up the middle. And they, you know, you know, push inside to clog that up. And then they just hand it to you and poof, gone. And then they go Tate, Tate, Tate again, and then give it to Cole Kelly, who, it's a combination I thought of you and you and Tate. I mean, how do you stop that? And then uh, I always thought Braden Lear should have ran the ball a few times. Some I don't know. If he, I don't think he ran one bootleg the whole season. I kept thinking maybe Kevin Eisman saving it for the playoffs and the playoffs came and I'm like, Oh man, no one is like, they're not sending anybody on Braden ever. He could slip by for a 50 yard touchdown anytime yep. he wanted to, but then he could pass it to, you know, you had a couple of good, uh, tight ends as well and that's just there's no stopping that offense all right we're going to do a few more sponsors and the part i'm really excited for uh talking some hawkeye football all right head on up to wilson's diner at 441 main avenue north and brit for breakfast lunch and supper they're closed on tuesdays but open every other day check their facebook page for hours and specials call wilson's diner at 843-0550 
Wilson's Diner is great food at great prices, and they look forward to serving you. That's Wilson's Diner in Brit. And then we have Daniels Auto Collision in Charles City. Owner Jason Daniels is a 1990 West Hancock grad. Whether you need a minor fix-up or complete collision repair, Daniels Auto Collision is North Iowa's premier auto body shop, and they'll have your vehicle back on the road looking better than new. With over 30 years experience and all major insurances accepted, why take your chances with anyone other than Daniels Auto Collision? Call them at 641-220-3805, email them at danielsautocollision at gmail.com, or check them out at danielsautocollision.com. Thanks to Sidetrack Lanes and Brit for sponsoring the podcast. Sidetrack Lanes opened in Brit in 1996. Go bowl at 411 Main Avenue North. Enjoy some food and a drink or two or three while you're bowling. Join the league and check out their events on their Facebook page. Call Sidetrack Lanes at 843-4567 or check out their Facebook page. That's Ron Bauer and Sidetrack Lanes. Michael and Brianne Ewing of Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company is one of my most loyal sponsors. They have locations in Britt Kanawa, Clarion, Belmont, and Dows. Mike is a 1998 West Hancock grad, and his family's been privileged to care for the communities of Britt and Kanawa since 1977. You can find them online at ewingfh.com or on Facebook. Give them a call at 843-3839 or 762-3211. That's Ewing Funeral Home and Monument Company. Thanks to Bill Frito for sponsoring tonight's podcast. Bill and Joe are buddies from church back in Brit, and Bill just wanted to say hi to Joe and support the Sanger Legacy Fund. So thanks, Bill. Jim Deemer and the Brit Vet Clinic. The Brit Vet Clinic is also long-term sponsoring this podcast. They're located in downtown Brit. They're there for all your small animal vet needs and swine vet services. Call them at 843-3416 or email the Brit Vet Clinic at britvetclinic at gmail.com. And then uh, this next sponsor, Joe, is one of your former teammates. He would have been a freshman. Um, wait, uh, 19, 20, 21, 20, Yeah, he would have been a freshman year, senior year, I believe. Uh, Brighton Kuji. Brighton uh, started Kuji Professional Power Washing. They're not just another business that's going to go to overcharge you for a service that you can actually do, do yourself. At Kuji Professional Power Washing, they offer affordable rates for a detail-oriented job. Kuji Professional Power Washing will make your house as clean and presentable as the day you bought it. On top of that, they also do driveways, which takes away years of grime and dirt. Call Kuji Professional Power Washing today for an appointment. 641-903-1031. Brighton Kuji, like I said, he's a senior at West Hancock now, and he told me the other day they're working their tails off because they want that third state championship. That would be, that'd be pretty amazing. Um, and I also have Levi Dawn as my last sponsor before we get to Hawkeye football. Thanks to Levi Dawn and his trucking company for sponsoring a bunch of episodes. Call Levi at 641-860-0077 or look him up on Facebook. That's Levi Dawn Trucking and Brit. All right, here we go. Hawkeye football. Let's, uh, how'd you land with the Hawks? What was the recruiting process like? And you came in as a walk-on, red-shirted, all that. How's that kind of look? Um, I'd say the recruiting process was kind of, um, it was, it was a learning process really, cause I didn't really understand anything if I'm gonna be honest. Uh, a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the recruiting process. There's a lot of shady stuff. There's a lot, of, I mean, you wouldn't believe it. It's crazy. Um, I think if you want me to give you like a quick timeline, I think, uh, yeah. my, my junior year after I won state long jump, I mean, I had a good, I had a good game against Hudson one state long jump. Um, that's when I, uh, St. Cloud State, uh, they started recruiting me a little bit. They wanted me to go there for tight end. Um, they actually cut their football team my senior year, though. So. Oh, really? Yeah, but um, St. Cloud State, um, a place I was really considering was Northwest Missouri State. They're like they're a D, they're a really good D two. Um, I was really thinking about going there, but uh, yeah, going in my senior year, Coach Neiman, he's the assistant defensive line coach here. He kind of he came to school and invited me to go to camp, and there was there was a lot of coaches coming to tell me to go to camp and stuff like that. But camp culture is like a whole different thing. I don't know if you know too much about that, but it's just a lot of it. A lot of it's kind of a money grab. You shouldn't. You should really only go to a football camp if they're um, they're like recruiting you. That's yeah. the ones you should go to, and you should really pick football camps for that. Like when I uh, when I go to a football camp when I was in high school, I went to football camps to to learn stuff to apply to my football season. I'd say. But a lot of the camps are a lot of the camps are more just kind of like a showcase and they have their people they want to go, go to. But 
yeah, I really wasn't going to go to the coach even came. He said, Hey, we want you to come to this camp or whatever. But I mean, it was just another coach coming to talk to me. The first time I met him is what it seemed like to me. Um, I wasn't going to go to camp. He kept calling me and said, Hey, you coming to camp, you coming to camp, whatever. He was really the, he was really one of the main coaches that kept calling me, which surprised me because I didn't know why he wanted to talk to me so much, but, <laughs> um, yeah, he kept calling me. I was like, okay, like I'll go. So I went to the Iowa state camp. I went to the Iowa camp. I like the, I like the Iowa camp a lot more. Iowa state does it a little different. Not really the way I like, not really the way I like it. Um, Iowa, I like, I really liked Iowa and I'm not an Iowa fan. I come from a, come from Iowa state household. My dad went, my dad went to Iowa state. So I've always been a cyclone. Fan. Just going to Iowa state, going to the game days and stuff, the vibe. Uh, I was just not, it just didn't feel right and stuff like that. But yeah. When you know, you know, you get that feeling and you're just like, yeah, it feels, feels like a fit for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, what were they telling you that they liked about you in the recruiting? Just the, the natural athletic and speed athleticism and speed that you had, they could see that you're going to, you could put on some weight and, you know, find a spot or what were they kind of telling you? I mean, kind of what you said. I mean, there's, there's like a certain build they're kind of looking for. And that's mm-hmm. a lot with the Northwest Missouri stake. I was saying too, he's, you know, you're six, three, you're only 200 pounds right now and you're moving really good and you can get this triple extension in your hips and this and that. And you're a good track athlete. Like you're a good runner. You're in other sports. You're good academically. That's yeah. a lot of the things they're looking for, I'd say. And I think I checked a lot of those boxes. So that's kind of what they were telling me, I would say, yeah. Yeah, kind of a well-rounded uh, mm-hmm. classroom, too. I think you know, I, I went to Central, where Tate is now, and um, I got to sit in kind of on the recruiting stuff every once in a while. And it wasn't just, is this kid a good football player? Is it is he going to be a good fit? Is he going to be a good teammate? Is he also a good student? Are we going to have to get him out of jail, you know, and, um, deal with all that type of stuff. So I think, yeah, you definitely probably check most, if not all the boxes. Um, so you came in as a, a walk-on. Um, are you still considered a walk-on? Are you a scholarship player? How does that work now that you're kind of in year three, four of this? Um, so I'm going in my third year. So um, like a, like a full division one, not an FCS school. There's, was it, it 80, there's 85 total scholarships. There's 125 people on the team. So I came in as a preferred walk-on. I mean, I'm working to get a scholarship. There's a lot of guys. There's a lot of guys who are also walk-ons that get a lot of playing time, and they're still not on scholarship. So, 85 total scholarships. There's like 40 or 50 people that aren't on scholarship, and I'm just one of those guys right now. So. Okay, but man, over the course of me watching Hawkeye games for years, decades, there's a lot of guys on the field that were preferred walk-ons, and then eventually got to that scholarship status. So, mm-hmm. um, it's not like you know, you're a preferred walk-on, you're essentially just a practice player. Most, most, a lot of those guys end up being regulars, right? Is that Oh, for sure. And I mean, I go through the same practice that everyone else does at the, Mm -hmm. at the facility. So, I mean, I do all the individual drills. I do all the special team drills. It really, I mean, this is like, um, this is people's livelihoods. I mean, they, Mm -hmm. they need to put the best stuff they can out there. They could care less if they're paying you to be there or not. So they're just trying to win the game. Yeah. During drills, they're not going to look at little note cards and go, oh, he's a preferred walk-on. Never mind. Even though yeah, he beat these yeah. guys in this drill or uh, in practice, no, he's, there's not a little star next to your name or anything. It's the best player plays. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, what was it like the first time, first home game at Kinnick um, where you came out? Well, describe that. Uh, underwhelming because it was COVID. <laughs> There's no oh, yeah, yeah. So the first real one you got to do, what was that like? Oh, so COVID? much fun uh, against Indiana this year. It was a lot of fun. It was fun to actually have fans there and there actually be noise instead of the artificial noise they were putting on there. Yeah. It kind of made kind of made the practices that much worth it. It was like you're actually, um, you know, people, I mean, people in my classes are like, oh, like, I'm so excited for the game and this and that. Like, can't wait to see you out there and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So kind of kind of brought it back to how football football used to feel in high school and stuff like that because I don't think anyone would have ever put money on the fact that we'll we'll always have college football the way it always has been there's nothing that would ever stop that from happening and then COVID hit and it was like oh boy I mean you lost a chance to repeat long jump champion your senior year in high school because of COVID and then you come to Iowa and it's like it had to have been just crazy because there was testing and social distancing and protocols. I mean, describe some of that stuff. What did you guys have to go through just to have a season? Oh, it was, it was scary. It was scary because um, like the big 10 policies were crazy. If um, 
-hmm. if you were in i'll give you some if you were so when you lift you have like a lift group you lift with like two other guys out of squat rack pretty much mm -hmm. and if like one of those guys tested positive for covid you got put like you got put in a hotel for 10 days like you couldn't yeah. work out or practice for 10 get for 10 days so it'd be people left and right it was like it was like they were just gone and it was like yeah. where's the you must have you must have tested positive or something or someone else must test a positive that was in contact with him and he was just out of there yeah. and you got tested you got tested every single day yeah. you, had to, you had to get your nose swabbed every single day and man yeah it was like you had to wear you had to the worst thing was you had to wear a mask when you were lifting so you're already yeah. doing these workouts and you're doing this conditioning and you're like can't you're breathing breathe. or whatever and then you can't yeah. actually breathe because you're sucking your mask in and stuff like that so that stuff that stuff kind of sucked but did you ever get uh sent to the hotel for 10 days one time i got i had a false um my freshman year before the michigan state game i had a false test because <laughs> i had yeah. to test that i had to test that night at like seven o'clock at night or something i know i got like a booger on the thing or something so it came <laughs> back positive and um i remember like i i we got like a football group chat like for my class and because like can uh cammy cammy pals like our head athletic trainer um mason one of my friends in our chat was like hey like cammy just got off the phone someone tested positive or something like i wonder who it was it's me knocks out a few other to, guys too i um here's the thing though there's a false positive they didn't know that though so i had to get another test and they i had to pack all my stuff up and go to the hotel and i had to, my test result came back like 3 a.m that morning and then i had so it came back negative because i didn't have covid oh, okay. um so then I had to walk from the hotel uh, to the stadium and dress up and go out there for the game. So that's, yeah, it was a, it was a weird 24 hours. I had to pack for 10 days. because I thought I was going to be in there for 10 days, but I was only in there a day. Well, I'm, I was going to ask until you said that, man, what do you do in a hotel room for 10 days? Like you would lose your mind. I think sitting in there, that would, Oh man, that would be, Oh, you can only watch so much TV. Guys. Yeah. And you can only sit there for so long before it's like, geez, I need to get out of here. And then they, you know, you got to be in shape still. So, I mean, yeah, you know, it was it's terrible. <laughs> it's I like, could see guys coming out just jacked up doing 3000 push ups a day or something like that, but there's only so much you can do in there. So mm -hmm. yeah, that's crazy. Um, you haven't actually seen action on the field yet. Um, but what would you say, just comparing practice, what's some of the biggest differences from class A ball? Brit, Iowa to Kinnick Stadium, the Iowa facilities, Division One Big Ten football. Biggest difference. Um just how like efficient the practice is. Um, you I mean you wouldn't believe it, you'd have to see it. It's um every timer and a horn goes off and you're sprinting to the next thing or whatever. And yeah. you the practices are they're the same time limit that we had in high school. It's just that you're here, you're there. Like when I first got here it was like y'all get in the huddle in the middle after you do your warm up stretches and then they blow the whistle. And it was like, I was just frantic, like trying to figure out where I was supposed to go. Cause no one tells you like you just, you're just yeah. supposed to figure it out. So I'm, I'm looking yeah. for like other linebackers and falling where they're going. And I like, I guess we have individual today. Like, I don't, it was, it, it's something. Yeah. And it's uh, talking to some people. I know that you had talked to, uh, we're talking about like individual drills. It's like you do things down to like the centimeter, you know, your footwork and where your hands are on certain drills. They want it here, not here, you know, and it's just mm -hmm. such attention to detail. Would you say that's a big, a big thing about the level that you're at is the, the minute attention to, to every little detail? Oh, for sure. I mean, uh, when I first got here and like, I'd have a rep and be like, Oh, like that was, that was pretty good, but everything's recorded. So you watch it that night and you're in that mm -hmm. linebacker room and it's like, uh, coach Wallace is like, well, you know, you had a false step right there. Like your hips weren't turned, you know, you overran the ball and this and that. And mm -hmm. I can like, I can see your eyes right now. You're not looking at the guard. And it was just like hearing all these things like, geez, like I, like when I first got here, it was my first week. I was like, I suck. Like I, like I, <laughs> Like I, like I suck, like I'll, I'll never be, I'll never be this good or whatever, but over time doing stuff over and over and, you know, you get that muscle memory going and you start to, there's, yeah, there's those details where it's just like, you just, yeah, you're always like one day it's like, I'm just going to focus on like my, my six inch step, my six inch yeah. step and like having my toes turned into my stance and this and that. And over, over time you get a lot better and over in, 
it's just there's so many things you can always look at on a play and there's mm-hmm. always a reason why you why you messed up and I think my biggest thing for me my biggest learning thing was that like making mistakes is awesome like it's the best thing you can do and it's like I want to make like I want to make as many mistakes as I can in practice and I want to make them all the time but when you're making those mistakes if you're going full speed making those mistakes like you're going to get so much better so much quicker and like it's mm-hmm. it's just a good thing to make mistakes all the time that's what I would say yeah and the thing is you guys were so well coached in high school um but it's even the most well coached high school kid to go from that level to this level is still just a huge jump um what did you realize when it came to like contact drills and the physicality of the game or is it did you catch up on that pretty quick or did it did you take your licks for a little while i would say um like physically you know at West Hancock, we ran the ball all the time. And I would say I had, I had a good understanding of, of like hitting people in football and this and that. So I, I don't think it took me too long, like for the contact side of things, mm-hmm. I think just learning how to like tackle correctly yeah. to the point, the tackling correctly is like the biggest thing ever, because in high school, I was taught that you're supposed to be like, get your head across when you're tackling somebody, but that's like the dumbest thing ever. It's like, no, what they teach you here is that you need to like look straight at him and put your eyes right under his chin pretty much. Yeah. And then you club up with your arms, but mm-hmm. phys- physicality wise, I mean, my freshman year on scout team, every once in a while you get hit or something and it'd be like, Oh my gosh. Like one time, yeah. one time a lyric Jackson, he plays for the Rams. Now he just won a super bowl. But one time yeah. I was playing Leo linebacker and I was coming off, I was coming off the edge and he pulled my way and he must've hit me in my, in my, in my throat with his arm hand or something like that. And I've, I've like never been hit that hard in my like I've never been hit that hard in my life. Like I had legitimately no clue what was going on. Like I couldn't breathe or anything. And my throat was sore for like a week. It was terrible. But, but now you can say I got almost killed by a Super Bowl champion. So yep. it's all good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that, that was going to be another thing I asked you. I mean, you have, there's several of your teammates now that are in the NFL winning Super Bowls. Uh, what are some of the, like the relationships you've built with certain guys and just seeing the, the success some of the guys that you've played with now are having? relationship wise i mean i think it's i'm I'm just a guy i like to see um like i want to see other people succeed i would definitely say and like nick neiman barrington wade those are two guys my freshman year that were linebackers barrington i you might not even know what barrington wade is but uh coach wallace i was talking about he's a guy that's like he was not he wasn't supposed to he wasn't supposed to stay on an active roster and he's he's been on the denver broncos this entire year oh. yeah he's on the broncos now yep um just like those relationships, you build those guys, like you want to see them succeed. You want to see them get their three years in the league so they can get their pension and this and that. It's mm-hmm. just, it's good to see. Um, it's good to see guys that are doing exactly what I'm doing right now. They did it five years ago and to see where it got them. It's a good thing to see. And it really shows that what you're doing works mm-hmm. and that it, like what you're doing is the right thing to be doing. So I think that really as it helps you stay focused on it. Yeah, and that kind of rolls in the next thing. What's made Coach Ferentz and the program so consistent over the years that you're seeing at practice and at games and the stadium? What is it about Ferentz that's rolling out these eight to ten wins a year every single year? Um, biggest thing probably communication. I mean, if you can get if you can get your strength staff, if you can get your coaching staff, if you can get your um, rehab staff, your nutrition staff, you can get everybody on the same page. And if you communicate with everybody, I think that, and like, if you're, if you're all, if you're all in it together and you're all there for the success of the athletes and their success leads to your success, then I think that's really why I was successful. And I think that's, that's a big thing. I think the second biggest thing is probably just um, how we practice and the way that we kind of play football. Like they always talk about like the Iowa edge and this and that, and Mm -hmm. just kind of like talk about the, we're always talking about um, break the rock and things like that you know you're hammering away at a rock and it doesn't break the first 99 times you hit it and then the hundredth time you hit it it breaks uh things like that are really a big piece of it um you got to read book like we have uh my freshman year we had to read the the slight edge and i think that like always pushing people to kind of learn and understand like the idea of like paying in every day i think i was just like a, a paying every day kind of football team in all honesty, where you got to do it every single day. And then yeah. when it comes to the season, you're going to be a lot better than everybody else. So. Yeah, uh, fundamentally sound. And uh, mm-hmm. would you say relationships, uh, 
Coach Ferentz and the staff, I mean, just the relationships they've built with you guys. I've never heard of a successful program where there aren't, you know, good relationship building skills there. Would you agree with that? Oh, for sure. I mean, and like when it comes back to like the recruiting thing, like the reason I chose Iowa with Coach Neiman is because in all honesty, he was the only coach that was really being real and honest with me. And um, mm -hmm. here's what it is. And I could really tell that, you know, he was, he was a family guy. His Both his sons played for Iowa. I mean, it comes down to um, uh, talking to you as a person. And I mean, a lot of these coaches, a lot of the coaches I talked to, um, two months later after I committed to Iowa, they were at a different school or they were doing something else. So I think the relationships and saying like, hey, I'm here for the long haul and I'll be your position coach and this and that is yeah. a big thing for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, Ferentz, you know, you we're lucky as, you know, Wes Hancock, Iowa guys, you can coach Sanger for 50 some years, Ferentz for 20 some years, but it was more than just, I'm here to win football games. It was caring for the people that make up that program. Um, you know, the once a Hawkeye, always a Hawkeye, once a whatever, you know, fill in the blank. It's um, seeing the relationships Ferentz has with a lot of his former players that come back and uh, how he talks about them and uh, defends his, his players and his coaches has always been uh, something that stands out to me as a guy that likes that loyalty and commitment to, to a program. Mm -hmm. um, which teammates of yours like wowed you, like just by their athleticism and plays they make on the field when you got out there and you're like, holy cow, like this is a different world. What, what teammates would you say were, were those guys um, before I talk about like, I mean, like freak athletes, um, do you know, who Brandon Smith is, he played wide receiver here. Yep. Yep. Oh, one time in practice, you got the, you got the dummies. They're like five feet tall. One time he just like, just jumped over it. Um, <laughs> it was, yeah, it was, he's got like a 40 inch vertical. That was crazy. But, uh, just wowed me athletically. I mean, there's a lot of guys that are athletic, but there's, you're right. There's a couple people that are like, holy cow, uh, Riley oh. Moss for one, I'd say. Yep. I remember my freshman year on scout team, um, we were running plays or whatever. This is during COVID. So the defense, the defense was a scout team for the defense pretty much. Mm -hmm. That was for a couple of weeks or whatever. That's kind of how I was playing fullback or something. And I had to go this way to block Riley or something. And the blink of an eye, he went like this or something. And then he was around me and like, it was like, holy cow, like yeah. fastest, dude I, fastest dude I've ever seen. Like, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, other guys, um, Jack Campbell, that's definitely for sure. I can remember, uh, it's probably this year in practice, but he's just the type of dude that no matter what, he just keeps going. Like you talk about a guy, like everyone, everyone likes to say like, Oh, this guy has no quit in him, but eventually that person starts to wear down a little bit. I don't think I've ever seen him like wear down like ever. It was one time in practice. He like his helmet came off and his nose was bleeding and all that. And he just kept practicing and he was screaming the signals and it was like, like, dude, you can chill. Like, it's like a, yeah. it's like a, it's like a Monday practice or something. Like, you yeah. can chill out a little bit, but it's a long ways till Saturday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you know a real close a guy named Jeremy Chaplin? Yep, he's my roommate. Yeah, uh, Chuck Boozman, a guy I did a podcast with. Chuck was a coach at Brit for years. Uh, he is good friends with Jeremy's dad, uh, Casey. Um, mm -hmm. He's the head coach, at, one of the coaches at Waverly Shell Rock, and Coach Boozman's on that staff, or he used to be. And he sent me a message last night, and he goes, "Make sure to bring up Jeremy Chaplin uh, yeah. when you're talking to Joe on the podcast." So, um, who else do you kind of live with then? Um, you guys have um, like pods. Uh, so I'm in a house right now with three other teammates. Uh, my freshman year in the dorms, Jeremy was my roommate. He wasn't supposed to be though. Gavin Cook was. He's from California. He didn't show up for the, he didn't, Gavin didn't come until December. So I remember like the first two days in the dorms, I didn't have a roommate. And then I got like a notification from the football team that said I had to move to this room. And I said, hi, I'm Joe. And there was Chappie. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> but Chappie's a great roommate. That's why I still live with him now. Uh, my other roommates, Jameson Hines, he's from Humboldt. I don't know if you, you may, maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he, yeah. he plays a uh, defensive back here. And then um, my other roommates, Eric, Ep AJ Epines's brother. Okay. You probably know who that is, I would assume. But yeah, yep, he did okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's a decent football player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's done all right. He scared me even just watching him on TV. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else can you tell us about what's it like to be on the inside of Iowa football? 
what's it like um uh, strength like, and conditioning we'll, we'll narrow it down strength and conditioning what, what's it like in the weight room besides the COVID year where it was weird pods and stuff with people like um what's that like uh lifting working out strength and agility speed and agility um for me i mean i'm always like uh like a science guy i mean i like i like knowing the reason why i'm doing stuff and i like knowing that this is like the best thing i could be doing mm-hmm. so i think the biggest thing with the weight room is that um I mean, you got five, like there's five or six coaches that all have their doctorates or whatever. And just the, um, just the expertise and like the reason why we do stuff and the programming and the loading to do stuff, I think is really interesting. That's what I really like about it. But in all honesty, it's just, it's, it's really nice um, to be at a program that's just completely funded. I mean, anytime a new equipment comes out or something or a new thing comes out, like we get to test it, we get to use it Yeah. in that sense. So there's never, there's no, there's really no excuse for me as to why I can't get as athletic as I possibly can. Cause I have the people, I have the right people telling me exactly what to do. They're providing me with the, the exact food I need to do it. And then I, I have all the equipment I need to do it too. So it's fun to, it's fun doing workouts. Uh, it's fun doing, it's fun doing, doing the stuff that you know is the best thing you could possibly do. Yeah. So, so like a week like this week where it's, you know, it's not the 4th of July week where you have a week off. Is it a seven day a week type thing? Do you guys do every other day? What's kind of your schedule for workouts in the summer? Well, you can't lift seven days a week. That well, I mean, like, do you, you never grow stuff in but... between? No, I'm kidding. Um, so pretty much what we're in right now, uh, lifting wise, is we just got out of like our GPP phase. GPP stands for general physical preparedness. That's really just put a bunch of volume on this guy to make sure like his system can handle it to like build build up his load capacity, pretty much. Right now we're in like, we lift Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And then Wednesday is like a skills and drills. It's pretty much just like your uh, individual period of practice. Like you do like Mm -hmm. your linebacker drills. You do like seven on seven against the offense, but lifting right now, we're kind of getting into our conditioning phase, which kind of sucks. But um, Mm -hmm. so pretty much what you have is like two, two uh, linear speed days, just running a straight line and then two lateral speed days. Like I said, so Mm -hmm. you have like your warm up. It's like 40, 45 minutes. Like you're, you're really out of breath by the warm up. Then you have your lift. And then today we ran two and a half quarters. So that was definitely a grinder and a quarter is six conditioning reps. So we did 15 different reps of things. So that's what we're doing right now. That answers what you're kind of asking. Yeah. So it's more than running down third street and then doing some sprints and playing some seven on seven on Sunday nights. Yeah. It's a little more than that, but that's great to do with your teammates in high school i mean oh man i miss i those are you know you take away the games and practice that was some of my favorite west hancock football memories was were those sunday nights mm-hmm. um cap captain's practice those were great mm-hmm. um but man just knowing you know what you're saying and talking to some other people just like you were saying everything is for a reason and everything mm-hmm. is specific and there's no wasted energy or wasted time that it's a it's a machine is what uh, it you're, is. it's a full-time job for it that's really what it is i mean i'm there eight hours a day so so how do you balance during the school year and the actual football season um in all honesty i'm, I'm happy i'm on the football team during the school season because pretty much how it is is um like get to the facility at 6 a.m and you have like you're lifting your meetings until about 11 30 and then from pretty much noon to five o'clock i have class and mm-hmm. then at, from 5 15 to like 6 15 6 30 you're at the facility again then you go home and study and go to bed but yeah. um how you balance it pretty much is like when i get to that 11 30 or noon and i start getting into my classes um i'm just like the most efficient person ever in those five hours because you yeah. have to be either like i mean i'm taking some hard classes and this and that so i think i like and i'm i've been doing really good in school uh the past these past two semesters i had a good i had um I had a 4.0 on my during the season last year, and then I think I had a 3.94 this past semester. So nice, yeah. Academic all conference, I saw. Yep. Um, just like I like I do a lot better. I'm like just the time management. Really, there's so much time in the day, and I mean, right now, I mean, I waste a lot of time. Everyone wastes a lot of time, but when I'm in that when I'm in that football season mode, and it's like here's five hours. And I mean, I have like football homework. I got to do too. Like I got to send in my notes for the opponent that takes like 45 minutes after practice. So Mm -hmm. when I get into those five hours I have for school, it's like, I'm not looking at my phone or anything. It's just, I am, I am just moved in. Yeah. I have have classmates, um, like my lab reports for biology and stuff. I have classmates who 
do it all the night before and I got mine done. I mean, four or five days before it's a do. And yeah. I mean, I get better scores than them. And there's a lot of people that, yeah, that are an honor. I mean, I'm doing better than the kids in honors and this and that it's when you, when you only have so much time to do something and when you actually focus your energy to something you can do, you can, you can do a lot. So. Yeah. Well, statistics show, I used to teach financial classes and mm -hmm. like kids who work through school are actually get better grades. A lot of parents are like, well, if they have a job, they won't have time for their schoolwork. It's like, no, they actually are better at time management because they have to be. And yeah. when you, when you have to be something, you, you get the results. I, I'm a teacher. And in the summer, I'm like, oh, I should get this done for next fall. But I also am like, I have 58 days to do that. Yeah. Guess what? It's not getting done until about two days before it's supposed yep. to, you know, I want it to be done when you're forced to do something. Oh man, it's a different world. So mm -hmm. Yeah. What are your, uh, what are your, so what are you eligibility wise? Are you, do you have three years of eligibility left? Um, eligibility wise. So my COVID year, my first year here didn't count. That didn't count for anything. And then I redshirted this past season. So I'm coming into this season as a freshman. Yeah. So you have, so four, have four years, years left. If I want to, yeah. If you want it to be, are you, are you planning on using those four years or is it just kind of wait and see when you get closer to type of thing or. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I'm trying to uh, trying to get into physical therapy school, so I have to apply to that this coming summer, going into my senior year. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we'll really see. How it depends on how the football goes and all that. I mean, if I got put on scholarship, I might consider staying another year or two or something, just because you could you could um, build up financially that way and this and that. But mm -hmm. yeah, it really just comes down to how the school goes and how the football goes. I mean, yeah. yeah. Your, what's your goal for this coming season? Are you trying to crack a, like a two deep in special teams or what's that kind of look like for you? Um, I would say my biggest goal. Yeah, definitely. Definitely getting on that, getting on the special teams. I mean, I tried really hard last year. I thought I was kind of close, but this year just comes down. I mean, I had a good spring ball. Um, Got to have a good camp. And I, yeah, I just want to be one of those guys that can be on those special teams. And then at the linebacker position, just continue to improve to learn and learn all three backer positions. I feel like mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest. Um, when I first got here, I didn't, I really, I didn't really understand football. Like I didn't understand the X's and O's. I was just athletic in high school and, you know, they just yes. tell you to go do something, you do it, but getting here and kind of learning and uh, coach Bell, he's the defensive line coach. He gave us a quote a couple of days ago where it was like person that knows like how to do something will do the job but the person that knows why will be his boss yeah. it's like why like i'll say something like um if they come out in like a like a like a troop formation troop pretty much means there's three receivers over here there's a receiver over here you know qb could be in the gun it could be like gun near troop so yep. it'd be like a three by one formation there's three receivers over here one person over here so the mike backer has to walk out and when he walks out depending on where the so the qb is in the shotgun if the qb is over here yeah. I'll, draw I'll draw it up here. I got to draw it out. I love it. Yeah. No, I, I'm with you though. Like high school football, yeah, you can learn some football, you can know what to do, and you can be very successful, but you can't expect 14 and 15 year old freshmen and sophomores to know the intricacies of everything you're doing. You just have to find those kids a job. You know, this is what you do on this play. But man, you get to that next level. When I was at Central, I learned more football in a couple of weeks than I did my whole life. And that's no knock against coach Sanger or the mm -hmm. staff. It's just, it's a whole different level of ball. So yeah. How's the diagram coming? Give me one second. <laughs> this is the first for the podcast, 44 episodes in, we got some yeah. diagram and plays. I love it. So, so you got right, you know, center guard tackle center guard tackle whatever you got your z your x your s your r which is what you call the receiver so i said true i said we got uh we'll say yeah i'll call it a gun near troop which just means and my handwriting's not very good <laughs> but i said gun near troop which just means that like the halfback is towards the tight end there's no tight end in this formation but the strength of formation is to this side that's why i have my z receiver there yep well, i'm gonna draw my mic backer in so
And is this stuff you have to do for your coaches? Like you, they make you like write stuff up or walk and talk through it as well. So they, they oh, can all trust the, all the time. Like, oh, that's why I said, I didn't really understand football all the time. Yeah. You have jock talk and this and that, but like I was saying, so we're I'm like, so I'm the linebacker, right? It's a three by one formation. Um, mm-hmm. So you got your Leo here, cornerback here, strong safety here. It's, I hope you can see this well. Yeah, but yep, so yep, you're good. Cornerbacks manned up here, right? Leo has, we're playing, uh, we're, Iowa plays cover three all the time, right? We have a two high shell or whatever. Maybe you don't. Yeah. You, yeah. But I, I get it. Cover three, right? This cornerback's going to bail. This strong safety has got like, it's quarter, 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 half right now. It's just nail, nail coverage. This is corner coverage, but the mic right here, there's three, there's a three, his, he is always matching three and his threes here. He's walked out. So the mic has to walk out of the box. Mm-hmm. Right. But they have this half back here. So what's stopping them. I'll, I should draw in the. I'm just dumping him out. So we only, we only have, um, what do we got? Uh, five people in the box right now, like mm-hmm. against the run, right? Your will backers there, your weak side backer. Yep. End tackle, your nose tackle, your end. They're in, they're all in the box, right? This is a pretty favorable formation for them. Wouldn't you say? Yep. yep. I can even make it more favorable for them. I could put the tight end over here. So yeah, everyone's like, the whole idea in football is that, if you if you if everyone has a gap if everyone is blocking a gap or if you all fill up a gap they can't go anywhere right yep like uh coach bill uh Bilicek for the patriots always talking about like dents in the defense like if there's a dent then you're screwed so this end's got this gap here right so nose has the a gap mike's supposed to have the b gap and has the c gap mike's supposed to have the b gap if he's walked out here what's stopping them from just running it right into his b gap right there yep so he's going to make a 14 call. He's going to, but the, it's, it's Mickey 14. So he's going to be yelling Mickey 14, Mickey 14. And what that says is that this nose gets out of this, gets out of the shade he's in and gets into a one technique. So the nose, the nose gets into a one technique. So now the nose got this a gap really covered up, but this end, this end gets out of like a, like a, like a heavy five and gets into a four technique and four technique mean, means he's head up on the tackle. Mm-hmm. So he split, he's splitting him right down the middle. And what that means is that our our defense always plays uh, inside gap to outside gap. Yep. So this end's going to play B gap primary and secondary C gap. So now they can't run it here. So we, if you can like, you always talk about like using your tool belt. Like as a defense, you can never fight a fair fight. Like he's got to use, I got to use my tool belt. So I walked out of my gap. There's no one. There's no one. There's nothing stopping them from running it in that gap. So mm-hmm. I said Mickey fourteen, and the end went in. At the end, got into a four technique. And now he's playing my B gap, but he's also playing that C gap. Like if I leave a gap, I got to tell somebody to take my gap. Otherwise they're just going to run it through that gap. Yeah. That makes and, then sense. You're, yep, and then you're in trouble. So yeah. um, it's, and you know, like I'll watch a game with my wife and I know a little bit of football, not that much, but mm-hmm. a little bit. And it's, you know, in their minds, it's just, Ooh, the ball gets snapped and everyone just runs to where the ball is. And I want to be like, Oh no, no, no. There are, there are a million things literally to think about before every play and then during every play. So um, as a linebacker, you're probably one of the the main guys who have to just constantly be thinking and Mm -hmm. just always looking at things and studying the game and watching film. And yeah, I love it. That was, that was fun. And so that's, that's literally just one formation. Mm -hmm. And if they took that the near side, that halfback, he was near the the three side, yep, the three and the they, side. They said, if they just shift him over, that changes everything, doesn't it? I say Mickey twenty five. I say yeah. Mickey twenty five, which puts this nose in a two tech, which is head up on this guy, puts his mm-hmm. end in a five. So now the nose is playing the A primary A, yep. secondary B, and this end has a C gap. Makes yeah. sense. So now those gaps are plugged up too. I'm still locked out, but I said. That's that's why I was saying like the the person who knows how versus the person who knows why. Mm-hmm. You got to understand why you're getting into a Mickey 14. Like why do I have to say that? Well, I just left my gap. I need to give my gap to somebody else. Yeah. Or you could yeah. simply just if you're the defensive line, you could simply just be like, I'll just get in a four technique because he's told me to. But if I understand why, it's like, well, they might try to run it in this really yeah. favorable formation, this really favorable run front we just gave them. They might try to run it. Yeah. And this goes right back to what we were talking about. Why'd they recruit you? You checked all the boxes, not just is he an athletic dude, it's academics and good head on your shoulder. Cause if you're in a position like that on the field, 
you have to be making audibles and changes and reads constantly. It can't just be, I'm fast and strong. I'm just going to go find the ball. It's mm -hmm. you do that. They're going to be, you know, doing Deion Sanders touchdown dances about every other play on you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to sit on a, on a coach's meeting at that level and look at all that stuff. That would be, that'd be a lot of fun. So, yeah, it's crazy. There's, there's a lot to it. And um, yeah, I tell my bro, I tell my brothers all the time, not all the time, but I've been trying to tell them that like when you're playing in high school, if you want to look really good, you got to realize that everyone else really isn't that good at disguising what like in the higher up you get in football, you're always trying to disguise what you're trying to do. Right. Mm -hmm. You don't, you don't want them to get a clue as to what you're doing. You don't want them to know where the ball's going. But the high school level, people like people get scared. They're not going to be able to get to their spot in time. So like if a guard's pulling, he might like lean that way mm -hmm. or he might be looking, he might be looking down or something like that, yeah. like looking in that direction or his hips might already be opened or his split to the center might be like it's supposed to be a yard. Right. We always have our splits. Yeah. Supposed to have. It's supposed to be like yard, two yards or something. He might be like six inches. His foot might be like six inches from the center. And it's like yeah. the skin scared. color on your down hand, if it's. Yep. red that means they have more pressure on their hand it's probably a run if it's whiter that means they're lean back in their stance it's probably going to be a pass mm -hmm. just little things like that always uh give things away but in high school you know it's here's your job do your job and your level you're looking for 100 things mm -hmm. all the time and then you have to perform at that high of a level it's i couldn't even imagine so it's pretty yep. cool there's a lot of things to the game and like I was saying, I mean, even if you, even at the 5A or 4A level, there's still, every single kid is still giving you way too many clues as to where the ball is going. Yeah. And you can make yourself look a lot better if you know, if all you, if like, you know, you like, I know he's going right there. I'm going to run right there and make the play. You yep. can, people are going to think you're a really good backer. So. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be fun. I hope your brothers are listening because we're mm -hmm. excited to watch them here too. in a couple months. So yeah. Um, we're going to wrap this up here. Uh, get back to my sponsors here real quick i want to thank all my sponsors for tonight the brick car truck bike and tractor night cruise ewing funeral home and monument company daniel's auto collision nick schmidt sidetrack lanes wilson's diner brit food center levi dunn trucking miller and sons golf cars the brit vet clinic the world with nate podcast the original saw mary joe's hobo house the west hancock hall of fame bill frito katie salon and tanning the brit bar and grill coogee's professional power washing and an anonymous donor uh, my next podcast coming up, I have Lois Stufflick, Dave Padrud, Kevin Sanger, part two. We're going to do a historical episode. The 2007 uh, seniors football team, we're going to do a watch along. Uh, Travis Hagen and then Sarah Swanson are my next six podcasts coming up through about late August, early September. Uh, Joe, any last minute shout outs you want to throw out there? Anything we didn't mention before you want to talk about quick or time is um. yours one last time here? Mainly, I just say, you know, thanks for having me on. Thanks for taking an hour and 30 minutes out of your day to have me on and this and that and working with me to get me on here. So I really appreciate that. Um, anybody that's trying to kind of get to this level of football or get to this level athletically or whatever. Um, biggest things I would say, you know, run track. I know Coach Welp has um, speed and agility. Uh, 7.30 or whatever they do at 7 o'clock pretty much throughout the whole school year. Go to that. Mm -hmm. I mean – if you're trying to get recruited, if you're trying to trying to look really good, it's a lot easier to catch people when you're really fast. So speed grows like a tree. You gotta you gotta water it every single day. Yeah. So sprint fast. You know, jump jump high, stuff like that. It's fun being athletic. Um, doesn't matter how big you are or whatever like that. Um, if you're a lineman, you're really athletic. That looks even better. So I would say to show up to the workouts. Um, football's fun. It's supposed to be fun. Um, for me right now, you know. 20% of the time, it's a lot of fun. 80% of the time, it really sucks. But the 20% <laughs> that it's really fun makes it really fun. If you're having fun all the time, you're not really having fun. Think about it that way. So if you're this summer, if you're, you know, having a little too much fun, maybe it's like, hey, maybe I need to focus in on these workouts, show up to these captain's practices, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people that have gone to West Hancock before me, uh, you said, like, we're talking about Coach Sanger been coaching for 53 years. You know, there's a good tradition going. Keep the tradition going. It's uh, you got to take a lot of pride in being from uh, this area and stuff like that, I'd say. But yeah, and I have fun. Go I'm going to throw it out there. We're don't keep the tradition going. We're we're looking at a dynasty, possibly. Yeah, there's, there's some good groups coming up. We can win a couple more of those titles. Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be pretty darn cool to see. Not just, oh, they made the quarterfinals and made it to the dome, made it to the first round. It's like championships. And I think these guys can do it. They just have to keep 
keep plugging away at it. Yep. I, like I was saying earlier, um, don't know the how, don't know the how, know the why. Uh, pretty much uh, another another quote Nick Neiman always says is either make the play or watch the play be made by someone else. Yeah. Up to you. So think about that. Yeah. Definitely. And one last thing here, Joe. Name, image, and likeness. N I L. You have to capitalize on your name. It is a unique name, Joe Smith. I mean, that Very name unique. stands yep. out. What are you doing for your NIL to make your millions on the side? Um, I'm not doing anything right now. Anybody wants to sponsor me, help me get through college. It's expensive. I'd appreciate it. But yeah, no, um, they got uh, these retention plans are coming out with the NIL. You probably don't know too much about it. I don't think it's been announced yet, but not much. Um, pretty much. I don't even know if I'm supposed to say anything about it yet. Uh, pretty yeah, much. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to say anything about it yet. They're going to start. It pretty much is how it's going to go down is to keep people at your school because, you know, other schools are throwing more money at you and all that. They're going to give you some money academically to, that only goes towards your academics and this and that to help That'd help that nice. way. So I got some of that coming in the future and that's good. But anybody wants me to uh, get on another podcast or reach out to me, I got plenty of time during the summer. Um, do a do a radio thing for you or whatever i'm all game so nice yep I, uh, joe smith man the possibilities mm -hmm. are endless yep definitely all right man well i appreciate you coming on i always end this with go eagles but we got to end it also with go hawks so go eagles yes, and go hawks yep i'd agree you bet. Thank you. thanks joe